Giorgio bought it. I didn't want to even sell it. So Giorgio Armani bought a Richard Hamilton, which you owned? Yes. Welcome back to my podcast, Steve Sunny Study. I've got someone in front of me who's been a huge part of the Richard Hamilton market. He was a friend, collector. Ken Moss, thank you very much for your time and welcome on board. It's great to be here and, uh, and be able to share some of my stories or my friendship with Richard uh, through the years. So uh, fire away, ask what you'd like, and I'll try and give you uh, the honesty of what went on between us and uh, what I think of his stuff. Yeah, perfect. Now, as you well know, Ken, myself, I'm the founder of Woodbury House. I'm not from the art market. I found myself right place, right time. It was thanks to Andy, got me involved with the market. And a bit like yourself, probably, Ken, but in a probably different way. As soon as I heard and knew about this Richard Hamilton market and the narrative and story, I fell in love. You know when they say in life, sometimes you find your calling and the penny drops? Well, this was it. Rather than your conventional gallery method, which is white walls, fancy shop or gallery in in, in London somewhere, and you represented loads of different artists, we're not like that. We're a private studio in the heart of Soho, a very intimate feeling, um, and we only represent one artist, which is Richard Hamilton, because we believe he's the most undervalued blue chip artist from the street art sector out there. That's my firm belief. And... On this, I, agree, I agree with you, by the way. <laughs> Good stuff. And on this road to, you know, getting the narrative out there to the public and to the wider world and to collectors and investors, I've been interviewing anyone affiliated to Hamilton. So Nemo Labrizzi, who is a big art dealer, who's coming on to my uh, coming over to my show on the 29th of October. Um, we also had uh, Oren Jacobi, the uh, director from the Shadow Man documentary which was a very good interview i've interviewed other dealers his doctors his barbers um and you've always been someone on that list i wanted to touch in with and, and talk about you know your relationship with him and your beliefs where the market's going so anyway big introduction uh, once again thank you ken and uh, let's 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 get to it so before we talk about you know you collecting and you know your your relationship with hamilton let's talk a little little bit about your background well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, I have a, a financial background, uh, made my money out of Wall Street, uh, starting companies and taking them public. Uh, I did five of those in my life. Uh, and essentially what I would do, I was always an oddball. I never worked for a really big brokerage firm or anything like that. I was on the outside, but had really good connections. So when I would find a deal that I wanted to do, or when I thought of a deal that I wanted to do, I would do it. I had the connection to be able to go public through a few different people and uh, would make a pile of money and then quit, basically. One of those times when I quit was in the early 80s. In, uh, I was living downtown. I was uh, nightlife, one of, the, one of the strange, I call it the 500 that were out every night. Uh, most of them were completely weird. I don't know how they ever made love money or a living, but we'd all be at the same clubs all the time. And through that... Uh, I would, was exposed to all the art that was going on down in the East Village. There was an explosion of uh, East Village art things. The first thing that really hit me, and I gather that it hit everybody, was uh, Richards doing the, uh, the dead man uh, mass murder scenes on the sidewalks of New York, You know, which was the outline of, uh, of a body with some red paint thrown down on it. And it would be, you always see the citizens uh, standing around with their attache cases in the morning and looking down at it and thinking like, oh my God, something terrible happened here. It was a very impactful, very strong image. And by the time you saw the second or third one, you realized, hey, it wasn't, wasn't real, but it was, it was very real and very visceral, and it really res- got a response out of the public. Sort of, it, uh, sort of after a little bit of that, the shadows started showing up downtown. Uh, Richard would, uh, I didn't know it was Richard, but uh, you would see these big black shadows that would be placed in areas that New York was pretty dangerous at night. Uh, it would be at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. You're on your way back from a club or to a club, 
and you'd walk around the corner in a relatively deserted area and there would be this big looming thing that would make you stop and sort of be shocked. When that happened, I decided I had to find out who was doing it uh, because I had collected things in the 1960s and lost all of those things and felt that, hey, this is really powerful and I I want to uh, find out who this is. So I tracked Richard down, uh, which was not really that difficult. And uh, being downtown, everybody knows, knew everybody kind of a thing and who was where doing what to who. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a real long-term, well more, well more than 10-year friendship with, between Richard and I. And literally, uh, it was interesting listening to your podcast with uh, about Jacoby, where Richard would let him just come in and video or film. Richard would let me just sit in his studio and watch him paint. So literally every day for over 10 years, I would go over to Richard's, hang out, watch him paint, and buy things. I didn't have a lot of money, uh, but uh, I would buy what I loved, and he kept evolving. It was really interesting. Um, The first place I ever tracked him down to, Stephen, was like, I hadn't thought of this in years and I've been writing down stories of memories of what happened to Richard or meeting Richard uh, because he was a very interesting character and a man. Uh, He was living in a total nightmare space. It couldn't have been more than eight feet wide. It was like studio space for artists on Broadway just south of Houston Street, south of Canal Street, excuse me. And he was living in this tiny little space with no window and he was sleeping on like either it was a dental chair or an operating chair or something like that in a room that was maybe eight feet by 10 feet, six feet, seven feet by 10 or 12 feet crammed to the gunnels with art supplies and stuff. I mean, there wasn't one yard of open space basically. And he had a can that he would pee in, uh, in, you know, it was like, you know, there so that he didn't have to go out in the middle of the night, uh, and it was like somehow or other, I don't know how, he worked his way out of that place. And he, he was became, in a way, the king of the East Village uh, art scene. Everybody, you know, was impacted by what he do- had done. And uh, it was really a part of uh, a part of the city, certainly a part of downtown. And he did it in Midtown and Uptown also, in again, in places that would really surprise or shock people. Uh, it's He was, without a doubt, like the first person that was really using the city as a canvas. Before that, graffiti was people writing Tacky 182. They were, right, they were right, just scrolling their names everywhere on every object that was flat, whatever. Richard actually used it as a canvas. And he was the first guy that did that so that you didn't have to go into a gallery or a museum and you didn't have to be an intellectual. It was visceral. You would you would respond. It would be like, wow, you know, it's scary. Uh, and then tremendous, you know, talent and art of, of of being able to bring that up in people just randomly that either cared about art or didn't care about art. So I would just wander over there every day, watch him paint, watch him go through iteration after iteration after iteration, which to me was one of the most interesting things about Richard in that I I knew all the guys down there. Keith Haring was a friend, not a good friend, but a friend. Basquiat, I used to actually let sleep on my floor when he was Samo before he became famous. And Richard, those two guys, uh, Keith and and Jean-Michel, stopped when they hit the cash register. Richard was a true artist. He didn't stop when he found the the cash register, he literally turned his back on it and walked away from it, and he pursued his art. The other guys, they were a brand at that point, and they just kept producing more and more of their brand. Richard went from shadow men to pussycats to the fabulous wave paintings, which were my favorites, and I heard uh, Jacoby say it was his favorites too. They're really powerful and gorgeous and really interesting stuff. And then he went beyond that into his beautiful paintings, 
where there would be reflections, almost Monet-esque or impressionist type things. Uh, and then he did super glazes. He would take blood from his, uh, you know, uh, his syringes or whatever and paint with that. I have a couple of those things, like five of those also. But I kept on, I couldn't stop buying every time he kept on changing. So frequently I would get either something really good I actually have the gun for the uh, the mass murder things signed over to me from 1976, which he made into a fabulous art object, uh, which nobody has really seen at this point. Uh, it's, it's bound into like a book that says evidence. Uh, but Richard just never stopped growing. And he was a very clever guy, low key, funny sense of humor, very dry. Very, uh, never, never exuberant. I mean, I'm talking more excitedly about him than he would ever talk. He was an intellectual about art. Uh, he was a really interesting uh, character. Like when you look at, uh, uh, let's say, his way of paintings uh, and some other things that he did, he would do a line uh, up and down that uh, from top to bottom on his work. And he would always say, this is what makes it a modern painting. And it would give the perspective that like you were outside a window or outside the scene looking at it rather than it might be a classical wave painting or wave crashing or uh, whatever it may be. And he would do that with taking black tape. After he was finished painting it, he would then take tape and it might be thick, might be thin, might be that wide. And he'd put them here and then he'd move it there and he'd move it there. Most of what he painted was really fast and just from the gut and from the brain. And this was like more of a matter of like, you know, like using his brain as to where exactly he wanted to do it. Uh, I spoke with an artist that knew him quite well a couple of days ago. And he said, Richard was the most interesting guy that he had a connection between his brain and his hand that really could control the line instantly and without any effort. And no one else that he knows could do that kind of a thing. His paintings of shadows or shadow cats or anything, they were just in him. They would just explode out of him. It was really, it was really interesting. And my experience with Richard was literally everything, excuse me for talking so much, <laughs> everything that he touched, he was like a master. I mean, I can't believe the quality of his super glazed paintings or the quality of his wave paintings, uh, the, the beautiful paintings, etc., And he could just knock them out. It would be really, really rare for him to miss something. And one of the funny things about Richard was he would, <laughs> he would never be finished with a painting. Uh, one of the, <laughs> one, can I tell a quick story? Or yeah, do you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, go on, far away. Uh, okay, he was, uh, uh, I was over at his studio one day and uh, he's there with a big painting. I think it was one of the horse paintings, the uh, cowboy things. And uh, and he's there with a scissor, and he's cutting it down a little bit. And then he cuts it down a little bit more. And then he cuts it down quite a bit more. And then he turns to me and he says, Ken, he said, do you think the, the guy's coming over here later this afternoon that I sold this to, do you think he's going to be annoyed? <laughs> it was like... Well, uh, I would be. <laughs> so one of the things I learned from that is when I would buy something from Richard off the wall as he painted it, I would take it with me that day, right then and there. It was like, you didn't leave anything behind. He might fix it for you and <laughs> destroy it, <laughs> in your opinion. Yeah. Which I have another story about with a, a friend who uh, bought something that I actually – created the, 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 the transaction for and somehow or other they scraped it or something happened to the painting and uh, they said oh can you get Richard to come over and fix this and whatever so I, I spoke to Richard and I said hey by the way that thing blah 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 and he said yeah I'll come over there and you know anyhow he goes over the, to their place they had a duplex in the American Thread building their painting is down, down on the, the ground floor of it and uh, he said, uh, go upstairs while I, you know, like I fix it. So they go upstairs, the husband and wife, and Richard is down there. And about a half an hour later, they come down. And he says, no, no, I'm not finished. Go back up, go back up. So uh, they go back up. 
And then about a half hour later, they come down again. And he said, it's done. And she looks at it and says, you ruined my painting, which he did. Uh, he had done, instead of the lines going vertical that he did, he did them maybe an inch high and maybe two inches wide. And he covered almost the entire painting that way. So that it was just, it was really an interesting thing, but he really destroyed it. So he gave him a new painting instead because <laughs> she was so unhappy. With, they were so unhappy with that. Um, I mean, this is definitely the blessing and also the curse of Hamilton. I've heard similar sort of stories from most of my guests. Now, I didn't realise this, Ken. That So you actually knew Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring. You said they stayed on, on, on your floor. So I want to ask you quite a, a direct question, which I know a lot of people who are in, who's interested in art would like to know from someone quite, who's quite credible like yourself. Jean-Michel Basquiat or, or, or Richard Hamilton. So who's better, Jean-Michel Basquiat or Richard Hamilton as an artist? Uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm just somebody who fell in love uh, with Richard's art. Uh, I've been an art lover. I'm here in Florence, actually. We just came from the Uffizi yesterday and the Pitti Palace today looking at Raphael's and Pontormo's and Botticelli's, etc. To give maybe a sense of what went on in those days and who was more famous and who might have been, quote, better or whatever the balance of power was, Richard would trade with artists down there. Uh, he traded with Kondo. He traded with Basquiat. He would get either two or three Basquiat's for one of Hamilton's. Keith wouldn't trade with him. So actually, Richard, another wonderful story about Richard. Uh, Richard was not to be denied when he wanted to do something. He just wanted to do it and did it. Uh, he knew where Keith was going because everybody downtown knew what was going on with each other kind of thing. And in New York in the old days, uh, in the subways, uh, when Keith was first coming up, he was doing chalk drawings uh, in the subway. If the subway system couldn't sell an ad, they put up black paper. Keith would go there and he did all those chalk drawings on the black paper. Richard knew where Keith was going, went out with his own archival paper, double-sided tape on the back, put them up in the subway, put up four of them like that. Keith came by, then Richard wasn't there, of course. You know, he went back home, went to sleep. If he ever slept, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if he, yeah, he would sleep always in the mornings, I believe. Uh, because he'd be up all night long, regularly, all the time, all the time. Uh, but at any rate, Keith went by, he did these four beautiful, you know, uh, subway drawings, which are in the book Art in Transit, uh, which I ended up owning eventually when Richard was desperate for money. I ended up buying those amongst other things. I should have bought a lot more. But it was interesting because I really felt as a friend to Richard. In a way, everybody in the planet Earth wants something from each other kind of a thing. People wanted Richard's paintings. He felt, you know, that they were his and that people wanted to use him or take things from him, I believe. And we did, in truth, whether it was, you know, whether it was Labrizis or whoever, whatever. Uh, hey, here's money. Well, give me the product that I want kind of a thing, transaction. I never wanted that really with him. But on the other hand, when he would be busy selling stuff that was wonderful for almost nothing at times, it was like, hey, why should I be the jerk that doesn't take advantage of this opportunity also? So I would give him money for things. In a case like that with the Keith Herrings that I ended up with, uh, it was thousands of dollars that I was giving him. And I had already learned with Richard and we were in a relationship tight enough that it's like, hey, okay, I owe you argument's sake, $10,000. Here's 800. When you want money, come back. And I would just keep the books. And he would just come back and I would give him more money and more money. And then finally it was like, hey, it's gone. And then I'd give him more money anyhow because he was desperate at times. Uh, and uh, that was the story. You know, that was how I ended up with those. So Basquiat or Keith. Keith was a sweet, wonderful guy. Jean-Michel was a very strange man. Um, uh, as to who was the best artist, you know, uh, I guess it's subjective. I guess maybe the, if you can believe the market, 
uh, you know, uh, at the moment, Basquiat has the, uh, the high numbers. Uh, Keith is next. Richard is still unknown, uh, but in my opinion, deserves to be. He's he was in my opinion he was the, the great artist of that time period, and he was a real artist. He just he had that creative thing that just wouldn't let him stop. As he said, I had this stuff in my head that just has to come out. He couldn't deal with the art world and the art market. He would go through dealers. You know, he'd drive them crazy. Uh, one time there was a, a, a show scheduled on Broadway right over uh, uh, where Dean and DeLuca was. <laughs> this is outrageous. And uh, there's going to be an opening on, you know, tomorrow at 6 o'clock. So tomorrow at 8 o'clock, I go over there figuring Richard's always really late. If he gets there at all, he'll be there at 8 or 9 or 10, even after the gallery closes. So whatever. I go over there and on, this, on the door is a sign, uh, come back again. Right now, there is no art show. So the next morning, I go over to his studio. And it's like... You know, I know what, you know, that there's nothing, you know, something happened bad. And I mean, we're talking, and this is on Christie Street, where he's got a two floor uh, studio there, the whole building at that point. And he said, uh, We're just talking in general, and I'm watching him do what he's doing. And I said, You know, I went over to, uh, you know, to, to the opening yesterday, and it, it wasn't opening. He said, yeah, can you believe that guy? He was outside downstairs screaming and yelling at me. Where is my art? He said, and he only did a color postcard for me. And then he's down there like I owe him something. It was like, woohoo. <laughs> uh, that was Richard, you know. Uh, you had to cut him a lot of slack. He had his own brain going on. And uh <laughs> He, he went through really good uh, dealers and, and uh, you know, he, he couldn't, he didn't want to be, you know, in anybody's stable. He didn't want to have to do anything that he had, quote, was expected of him, I think. And like I said, he was a very clever, sly, uh, soft-spoken, uh, wry, very dry sense of humor. I mean, it was like, he never yelled. He never raised his voice in the 10 or 15 years that I was really close to him. Uh, it was just really, and I would always think, hey, I just know this fabulous, talented artist. Artists, in my opinion, are they're a little bit odd, as we know. And uh, I cut him slack, and I was just happy to be in his presence and to be able to watch what I thought was a great artist make his art. And I would be careful not to try and influence anything. He might ask me, what do I think or something? And I would always basically duck. Maybe I would say, you know, like, I don't know about this or that. Uh, but in general, it's like, hey, I don't want to interfere with, you know, with the creative genius that's working on, on an artist, basically, whether they're geniuses or not. Yeah. So um, you said something about uh, comparison between uh, Basquiat maybe Herring and also Hamilton, you said, you know, how the market determines how successful they are. As we well know, it's no secret, Jean-Michel Basquiat, 2017, sold for $110.5 million, whereas Hamilton in 2019 sold for over half a million dollars in Phillips. In your view, can Richard Hamilton's market, can Richard, ha what could a Richard Hamilton piece of art ever get to 100 million plus? Well, it depends on the rate of inflation that we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, to me, you know, $100 million for a piece of art is a pretty strange number. Uh, you know, part of it has to do with probably Jean-Michel is a black guy. And, uh, you know, there's a cycle that goes on with uh, women artists, people of color, white artists, etc. Uh, that's one of the factors that might, might be playing into that. Richard, to me... Uh, is still an undiscovered artist. Uh, he might have sold for a half a million dollars for one beautiful piece. It was really an interesting piece. I saw it was, that's the one that sold in France, or the end of the world, I think it was called. In Phillips, it was uh, called Mut Shadows. And there was the Mutiny piece, which is the Seascape. And then there's been a, a few um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, jumping shadow figures, standing shadow figures, ones with movement, which are sold for 300, 400,000 over the years. 
in auction. As we well know, Ken, in the private domain, I mean, I, I witness day to day that, you know, big, large rodeo, Marlborough men, they're selling, you know, round about the million dollars now. Uh, and that's in the private really? domain. Really? Uh, I had no idea that that's really what's going on with it. Uh, it's not one of my favorite pieces of, of his work, but uh, like I said, hey, the market speaks. Uh, Richard is still undiscovered. Uh, I know that you're involved in putting out a book. That'll be the first thing I think that really sort of brings Richard to a wider audience. And I really applaud the fact that you're doing that and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, uh, I know that there's another one planned uh, later on next year from another big publisher uh, that will also help bring Richard's awareness to the world. That's Rizzoli. Uh, he's just an, uh, he's still an unknown. I mean, the people who really follow art uh, are probably aware. Uh, he was never, I, you know, people would think that he was dead because he disappeared. Uh, and also he had a terrible drug problem. Although I'll tell you something, I was with him every day for well over 10 years and I never saw him shoot dope but I know that he you know having seen the movie it was like oh my god you know like nightmarish of what what ultimately went on he was a beautiful young man he had beautiful girlfriends uh he was an elegant character uh as I said you know he was clever he was verbal um you know he was famous everybody wanted to you know to a, a piece of Richard as it were uh, maybe that's part of what drove him away from everybody. Uh, you know, who knows what's really going on in somebody else's brain kind of thing. But from an art and value point of view, I believe that Richard is probably in inning two of a nine inning game. Uh, I would say that probably 85% of the people that know about Richard don't have any idea of how broad his his talent was or what he could do. Eventually somebody or some museum or whatever is going to do a, you know, a, a real retrospective and put things out there and people will just be blown away. And at that point you're going to see probably prices go through the roof at that time because he, he was, he was a master at everything he touched. One time I'm sitting with him and my wife was with us and we're just, talking he takes out a black piece of paper and a scissor and in one thing he cuts a a, a, a portrait of me a silhouette. a silhouette that was you know just terrific and it really looked like me including my i actually had hair in those days and was up and out the nose the whole thing uh, on a profile and then he wrote you know uh, to ken uh, richard uh, but he was just and like I say, he just had this um, amazing talent. Well, and as this artist said, his connection, his hand, he just, he inherently just had this in him and it would just come out of him in one shot. He didn't have to do 10 sketches or something. Uh, he did, you know, he would just put it out there. Uh, and he could work small, he could work big. I have a, a, a wave paint. I have two wave paintings that he did. Uh, one of which he always talked of is he called the paper piece. It's about six feet wide. And it's like a big crashing wave, even though it's small. I mean, most of the big wave paintings you see are eight feet, 10 feet. You know, they're, they're big and throw up the, the white paint. This he did with like a brush to, to do the, the, the foam kind of a thing in a, in a tight controlled area. Bang, he just did it. And then this other one that I have of his, he did it in pink. And it's like a volcano exploding on you. You never saw anything with the, the sense of power of what this painting shows. I mean, it's really remarkable. And I don't think any, you know, maybe 10 people in the world have ever seen it. You know, Sotheby's came by, they wanted to see, and he said, maybe we'll do a show of all of Richard's work. And they really wanted to sell his work, cause, you know, wanted me to sell his, my work to them, through them. Uh, I'm, I don't want to sell anything. I'm very personally connected to the paintings and uh, they mean something to me beyond just the paintings as they are. Mm. Uh, I remember how I got them all, where I got them, uh, the things that would go on, like his beautiful paintings. I have the first one that he did. It was like, you know, I'm there and he just does it. He says, 
what do you think? I said, I think I'll buy it. You know, uh, how much do you want for it? And it's a small thing about like that. Uh, and then he did, did a whole series of that. And then he moved on. And he would move on. Then I would buy the next thing. And then the next thing. And then the next thing. Meanwhile, I didn't have that much money. And I built a fabulous collection with really low dollars when you look at what's going on today. Uh, and I'll tell you, what's going on today has really had a, a very interesting, strange impact on me as a friend and as a collector. I bought a collection because I loved what I was seeing and I loved the guy that was doing it, basically. Now that everything is worth money, I look back and I thought, oh, what an idiot I was. I should have bought this. I should have bought that. I bought this for that guy. I bought this for that guy. I love them. My collection is in those people's houses, etc. Mm. <laughs> I've often thought that if they did a show of my collection of what I collected, I should go back to all these people and say, well, let me have those all of those because that's what I collected and they were you know they were endlessly beautiful in my opinion and I was delighted that my friends ended up buying some of these things uh, Richard you know would always run out of money I fixed him up with this restaurant so that I said if you're ever hungry you can eat at this restaurant all the time the guy you know loves your work you know give him something he gave him a horse you know, a, a cowboy thing. Mm. I know somebody who just bought it from that guy for, you know, a serious amount of, more, well more than a hundred grand for it. Uh, you know, and that was for food for Richard. You know, uh, so, you know, I did all these things. I would do it to try and help him, you know. It's like, hey, he was a crazed artist that was fabulous. But well, I wanted to, you know. Ken, you, you may not know the answer to this, and it's quite a personal question, but since we're talking about your collection, I want to ask it, Okay. Um, if your whole entire collection were to come onto the market today, let's say Savabiz Christie's, how much do you think it would be worth? That pink one that I was talking about, I've always thought it's worth millions. I mean, it's like you you have no idea of, you know, when you, if Richard, if anything is selling for a half a million or a million and this thing came, you know, came to market and Richard was better known uh, this thing would this 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 one would be worth well over a million dollars just on its own. Uh, I bought it with there were three of them up on his studio wall at the time. Uh, this pink one, a second one that I have, and the third one I actually loaned to Andy Valmorbida for uh, uh, one of his Armani shows, or I don't know which one. And Giorgio bought it. I didn't want to even sell it. So Giorgio Armani well, bought a Richard Hamilton, which you owned. Yes. Which I'm, it was the worst of the three. And that was, I think that was his deal of like, Hey, you know, I'm helping to promote this, you know, these shows that are going on. Uh, and I guess he would either have a certain pick or whatever, but at any rate, Armani ended up with the third one of this trip type that I have. Well, so one is, Crashing wave, and then the skyscape, and then uh, I don't remember whether the Armani was like a, a rainy scene, uh, sort of a purplish, bluish uh, painting. Well, Giorgio Armani, like Giorgio Armani is a fashion tycoon. I mean, everywhere you go around the world, from rich economies to poor economies, we all know the brand Giorgio Armani. What is, does it say to you when someone like Giorgio Armani is buying Richard Hamilton artworks? Well, it's, it, obviously, it's a man of great taste that uh, can buy whatever it is that he wants to buy, whether he, <laughs> he probably has Picassos also. Uh, I think it, it speak, it's like an imprimatur of like, you know, it certainly says that, uh, hey, this is uh, first rate stuff. He doesn't buy crap, I'm sure. Uh, so from that point, uh, you know, it's there. The fact that... Uh, that uh, he would even attach his name to Richard Hamilton shows. I think they did two of them in New York. I think one of them in Milan. And did they do one in London also? London and also in uh, Russia. Really? I, I didn't know in the Russia thing. But I would loan uh, early things to, uh, to Andy to help round out those shows. Like the stop sign that, uh, that's been reproduced was mine originally. And I sold it to them. They, they, it was in one of those shows. And he said, please, you know, uh, uh, this somebody want, wants this one. 
And it was like, no, 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 that's not the one, you know, like, I don't want to sell that one. Oh, please, you know, sell it. Like, give me $2,000 more. And then, you know, and that's what, that's what happened on that one. Uh, and now it ended up as like the one that's reproduced out there. Uh, I had originally uh, had a whole bunch of, I still do have a whole bunch of uh, stop signs. And I even have one that says dead end, which is the only one like that uh, in the world that I've seen at this point. Beautiful. In time. If I can ask the, the, this question, and if I can list some of the different styles by Hambleton, because I've never gone through this before with any of my guests, and I don't think I've ever he- heard anyone talk about Richard Styles like we're about to. So obviously you've got the the one that we call the bread and butter of Hambleton, which is his shadow heads, okay? Obviously on paper or on canvas or sometimes other mediums. You've obviously got uh, the landscapes, seascapes, Cloudscapes, you've got the Bloodworks, you've got Shadow Hearts, Shadow Cat, Shadow Man, Shadow Women, um, you have uh, the Jumpers. I don't have a Shadow Woman, but uh, he did some nice ones. Yeah, you've got the um, Nightlifes, you also got the I Only Have I For You, you've got the Rodeos, and the list slightly goes on from that. In your, in your mind, um, the ones that people talk about are the ones like the landscapes, because obviously that one, the seascape, fetched over half a million dollars in auction. Standing Shadows is connected to the Shadow Man documentary, so everybody wants to shadow heads or shadow figures. Got the rodeos, because they're so beautiful, they've got so much movement. But what about the other pieces that people don't speak about so much, like the Bloodworks or the Shadow Cats or the Shadow Hearts? Where do you see that, those going? Who, who, who's going to be collecting them, them works? Well, I think... People will be collecting everything. Uh, as I say, when people really see the the broadness of this guy's talent and the, where his mind went to, you, like I said, you know, a Keith Haring you look at, everybody in the world knows what a Keith Haring looks like, and it's on your shoes, it's on a T-shirt, it's on, you know, your backpacks, whatever. They He didn't move. That was it. Basquiat, I think, was probably very important in a way as I'm – beginning to understand in that he sort of graffitized the world. Uh, You know, I don't think he was a very talented painter, painter, but he had like something that, uh, you know, that, that was a fulcrum point in the world, like Andy Warhol with, with soup cans uh, where he took instead of the fine art of the Renaissance, which I happen to love and turned it into the commercialization and the replication Massively, I mean, Andy didn't even do those. Gerard Malanga did all the uh, the screen work for uh, for Andy. Uh, you know, it's just they just knocked it out, kind of a thing. Uh, Richard, you know, a it's it's funny that you, you that you say in a way. Uh, you know, to me, his iconic stuff is the big shadows that were there. If you lived in New York, you got a. a you got a jolt of electricity from seeing these things out in the street. You don't have that same jolt of electricity when you look at them on canvas, but you see it as art now. Uh, so I was stuck with really seeing them as street art trying to be transferred onto canvas. Looking at them now, I see them as art and they're fabulous. Whether they're heads, I have a couple of shadow heads that are wonderful. He did two of them for me on these plastic mirrors, you know, and bang. I mean, watching him paint was really interesting. Mm-hmm. I would actually sometimes go out with him and do shadows. Not often, but but occasionally. It's like, can grab a bucket, you know, it would be one of a, a, a paint bucket here and, a, and a, a brush or two here and out we would go and he would, and he was fearless and he didn't give a damn about the cops or anything of being arrested. He, wasn't even vaguely in his mind. I'm there like this, you know, being, hey, I'm a businessman. I, you know, I, I can get sued. He's an artist. He's going to get famous for it. This is, mm-hmm. this is good for him, bad for me. And, you know, he would help. Sometimes I'd go out with a ladder so he could climb up and over on stuff. Uh, he, he, did, he did things that were uh, also unsuccessful from, let's say, a longer term, uh, long existence kind of a thing. He would take uh, the, the hoods of an automobile, 
uh, and he would grind them down, take all the paints off, grind them down with, you know, uh, some kind of a power tool or whatever. And he would use like the line that would run down the middle of like uh, uh, Pontiac Fury or whatever. I don't even know the names of these things. He would use that as a horizon line and create like a skyscape with, with you know, an electronic tool, you know, grinding it down and do that. And, you know, I saw maybe four or six of those. And then what would happen is Richard was always being thrown out of his studios because he'd never pay rent. He was a really irresponsible character on a certain level. I once sold $100,000 worth of his paintings for him. Never made a nickel off it because that was not where I was coming from. What I wanted to do was be able to buy things cheaper because I didn't have a lot of money and I'm not an art dealer. Another one of those mistakes that you learn over, you know, over time. Uh, I'm sure they ended up in the trash. We would be walking down the street and there'd be a piece of wood, uh, you know, from like the top of a thrown out uh, sewing machine or whatever. And it would have like a horizon line, you know, the way things are like, they call it bookmarking when they split something in half and you have like the two halves and it creates like a horizon line in between. He would take that and then he would just carry it home and, you know, and, and, you know, make it into a, a beautiful piece of art. Plastic mirrors, he would take and he'd put it down and with a brush, bang, bang, you know, dip it in, and that's the sprays that would happen. And then the last things that he would ever do on those things, but he would always do the ears. He would then just do that, you know, and they might, you know, like put in a necktie or a shadow, you know, something like that. But he, he could... He could do one of these fabulous paintings, and I mean really, you know, powerful, beautiful, big, whether it was a horse, whether it was a, uh, I have something too lost in uh, in Marlboro country. At one point, he was taking Marlboro ads uh, from the back of magazines and overpainting them, and that you could just vaguely see underneath the big Marlboro thing. And it would be like, this is two horsemen in like a rainy blue sky with one of these black lines down. And it's just, and it's written as a two uh, two horsemen lost in Marlboro country, and it's like nineteen seven eighty two or something like that. I have a bunch of things from eighty four, eighty six. Uh, when I knew Richard, uh, to me, in a way, uh, it was you know looking in retrospectively, it was the golden years. He was a golden you know character. Uh, he was creative. He was funny. He had his shit together basically. I read that book, Hero of Art, uh, and cried at the end. When you when you saw Richard, you know, at the end of Shadow Man, and I saw him at the Phillips show that they did in uh, in New York, and here you have this tremendous, glor- glorious, everybody's rich, everybody's famous, uh, models, uh, well-off people, 57th Street and, and uh, Park Avenue, and Richard comes in, he's bent over, he's already being eaten away by the skin cancer on his face, uh, you know, he's, he's not well dressed, but he's still elegant in a way. He would never clothe, he would wear sports jackets a lot. He never had short sleeve shirts on in the time that I knew him, but he would never close up the bottom. So it's not like he was hiding anything. Uh, and he would use one of those you know, paper clip, kind of not a paper clip, but whatever, you know, alligator clip kind of a thing to pull his jacket together. And that was one of his classic things, uh, that he would always do. We went, uh, my wife and I went with him on Halloween night for a uh, outlaw party. They used to have these terrific parties in New York that were completely illegal, done in, uh, in illegal spots. And, uh, they were doing this one on Halloween. And I go over, you know, we, we didn't have costumes on. And I go over, we pick him up at the studio. And it's like, I look at him and closely he, up here, he's taken a push pin. He's cut off the pin part stuck that onto his forehead and did a little red line as if there was a push pin stuck in his forehead right over here. You know, so he had like a wonderful costume, but very subtle, very easy to travel with. You know, you weren't going to be in a sweaty costume or anything like that or a face mask. Just, you know, like a real, you know, just a, a, a brainy kind of a, a thing and a character. And a very effective. It was one of the best costumes I think I ever saw in a way. And the party was terrific also, by the way. Yeah, I didn't I even get broken up by the cops. 
I can only imagine. So, Ken, um, we've we've spoken a few times, and you and your lovely uh, other half, Anne, who uh, have both been over to the studio a few times, and we've spoken about Rich's work and about your relationship, etc. I'm I'm fishing for a bit of a compliment here, but I think it's I think I I would like the viewers to hear it because you've been such a big part of Richard's life and his market. You're a collector. You was also a bit of a dealer without even realizing for him, for 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 him back in the day. And you said to me, you know, Woodbury House, I believe, is the go to place now for for Richard Hamilton. Do you still believe that, or what sort of part do you think we play well, for his market? You know. But, you know, yeah, we're on the same, you know, podcast here. But the truth of it is, uh, I think that you guys have uh, really gotten it in a way. Uh, uh, I think you've been aggressive in uh, seeking out his work, in promoting it, uh, in bringing it to uh, uh, to the awareness of the of the art people, not only art people, but but investment m- money people. Uh, you know, it's funny because a transition happens of art into value and money at the same time. And I think if I, quite honestly, if I were looking to buy something at this point in time, uh, I've been in your space any number of times when I'm in London. And uh, you have really some really beautiful things there. Um, I'm sure they come and go as you sell them. And uh, there's, you have one thing there that I wish I had the money to buy. I mean, it's like this. this that it's it's in your other room with it's that white shadow head that goes up into uh, like yeah. sort of a pointed area on the black thing it's right off of the frame and everything gorgeous thing if I had seen that you would not own it let me tell you I would have gone <laughs> uh, so, and and uh, and I would have paid much less than you did and <laughs> I could yeah. could sit here and say to you no Stephen I don't want to sell that I don't care how much you're offering me for it you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, I think Woodbury House is uh, certainly in Europe, and uh, I, I would say, you know, if I were looking to buy, I would definitely want to be at your at your shop to see what you've got. For sure, I think that you're you're the guys that are hunting around still for the uh, the, the, the good pieces that are out and floating. I know that you've tried to get things from me, and it's like, hey, I'm not willing to like come up with them. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, what, what can I say? Uh, I have too many of them. If I were selling, I would be, uh, I would be thinking that you're the guy to sell it to, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I re- I'm really humbled by that. So, um, I mean, we as a brand. You shouldn't be. You, you deserve it. You know, I'm serious when I say that. Oh, thank you, Ken. And uh, one thing I, I, you know, I, you know, from my perspective is, um, there's no one really else out there going, and interviewing, you know, and creating this ecosystem around Hamilton. And you know what? Um, Obviously, we're in business and part of business, you've got to make money. That's how you keep the lights on. But it's more than that. It's the passion. It's being intrigued. It's trying to find all these great stories that people must must hear. Because the Shadow Man documentary done a really good job, you know, really told the story. But there's intimate stories that you would never, never hear unless people met people like you, Ken, or they listen to a podcast, and I think it's important. That's why I'm trying to get the message out there. Well, I, I appreciate what you're doing, and you know, uh, in in a in a way, it's like let me throw in one quick funny story to you, just as a matter of like, uh, I had no Richard always kept his life in separate pieces. I believe, yeah, you know, he'd know this guy, he'd know that guy. Are we out of time? Am I? No, no, no. I'm sorry, there was someone at the door, and I wasn't too sure it was. Okay. Uh, so at any rate, you know, he had his own, you know, he kept, he kept things separate in my opinion. You know, that many of the people that I now know had, you know, real dealings with him. And I was close to Richard every day, all the time, you know, more than 10 years, literally every day for probably 15 years or close to every day. Never knew them, never knew whatever. And he had different segments of his life. But one time, uh, uh, I, I go over to his place and and he's got like a giant one of these Pontiacs from the '60s or something like that, and he has matte painted it black, the whole thing, all the chrome, all the you know the tires, everything is matte black. I think maybe even the license plate. I don't know about that, but at any rate, he loans it to me 
So I take it out to the Hamptons for the weekend. <laughs> and, and it was like the ultimate skunk at the party kind of a thing. You know, everybody's got these expensive, beautiful cars or whatever. And I have the shadow mobile with me, you know, <laughs> it was really like, it was really funny to, to experience that. Yeah. And then I never saw the car again. I gave it back to him, of course. And you know, I was like, hey, that was that. Uh, he would, he would, uh, he would be without a studio, and uh, he was an incredibly handy guy, by the way. He could do carpentry. He could do plumbing. He could do, he could do electricity. He did everything. He would always find these spaces in New York in terrible neighborhoods in downtown, and he would find, like, a place that was uninhabitable. He would find the landlord and say, hey, I'll fix it up, uh, you know, when I want six months free, uh, you know, uh, uh, rent yeah. and he would get in there and he would like dig out the garbage put in you know like shelving and a bed and this and that and electricity and plumbing and bingo and then the next thing that would happen is six months would be up he wouldn't bother paying his rent of course even though he had money he was just you know that was who he is and you know and then he would be thrown out and who knows what kind of things he had that were thrown out with you know with the empty place a quick funny story about a Basquiat. A friend of mine who's an artist was taking over Basquiat studio on Ludlow street, which is right around the corner from Katz's down in the Lower East side. And Basquiat had just left because he had now had the deal. He was like, whatever he had done the front of the refrigerator with as, as a Basquiat as the front door of the refrigerator. And my artist friend said like, he was there talking to the landlord and the landlord said, you know, like, okay, you got the place, you know, it's yours. He said, I'm going to throw out all this shit. And the guy said, well, what about that? He said, you can have that, you know, the refrigerator. So my friend pulls the refrigerator door off and he starts bringing it to his studio or his home. I don't remember what it was, probably his home. And uh, he said, I, I went three blocks. He said, it was so heavy. I just left it in the street. So it was a Basquiat, you know, <laughs> refrigerator door which is worth a fortune today if it would still exist oh my god and this artist millions. has no money to speak of crazy and martin wong by the way who was a great artist he was like a gay cowboy in uh in the lower east side died of aids uh but he had uh uh he had a keith herring refrigerator done on the sides the top and the door and I, I often wonder whatever happened to that refrigerator because that thing would have been worth a fortune today also. Yeah. Like, you know, it was like all these artists would hang out with each other and while they're there, they would doodle and whatever, you know, and it's like, hey. Yeah. By the time uh, this um, podcast comes out, allegedly, according to Andy and the Richard Hamilton Foundation, the New York Times are about to release an article about Hamilton being a part of the Masters, which is the greats. And for anyone that doesn't know, the greats are Picasso, Roy Lichtenstein, Tom Wesselman, Andy Warhol. You could say Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, fall into that category. And now they're actually pushing Hamilton there. Where would you say in your own mind, Ken, where does Hamilton sit as far as the greats are concerned? I would put him at the pinnacle, certainly, of the East Village 80s time scene, 80s and 90s kind of a thing. And when Richard really needed money, he could just produce great things all the time. I mean, he might have been a terrible junkie if you saw, you know, the Shadow Man movie. But he would always be able to produce first-class work. Always. I mean, it was really remarkable to me to watch. Uh, at one point, he was living in the Bowery in a flop house. He would come to me and he said, Ken, I'm living in this flop house. If I don't give them $50 every night, they're going to throw, they're going to put all my stuff in a garbage bag and throw, throw it out on the Bowery. So every four or five days, he would come over and I would give him, you know, like $500 or, you know, whatever the number was. He would disappear and then he'd come back the next week because, and I'm sure probably the flop house was $20 and $30 was worth the dope, basically. But, you know, like, hey, what, you know, what do I care? Uh, you know, uh, Richard, like I said, he was a sweet guy. Uh, he, he was non-destructive. He was, he was really a positive character, but he was like, 
he was great. I mean, I'm telling you, you if you if if we were together now and we were near my collection, uh, you would see that this guy, everything he touched, he was a master. I mean, you know, I mean, the glaze, the super glazes, which you very rarely see. These are not even the you know the women's name things that you know that are there, which I have one one or two of. Uh, they're nice, but after that, he did even more super glazy kind of things that were just spectacular. That, and when you think of like that in comparison to a shadow, that he was just splashing paint, but not splashing it, controlling it. I mean, the guy was like really, you know, really spectacularly interesting. He was the master in my time. Yeah. And somebody mentioned to me, he said, hey, you know, Ken, you're really lucky this lawyer who's actually, he's, he's El Chapo's lawyer, believe it or not. <laughs> and he's an art, he's an art collector and his son is a painter. He's like a good guy. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, he said, you know, Ken, you were really lucky to know these people. And I realize now it's like, hey, it was like being in uh, in Paris in the 20s and hanging out with uh, Modigliani and you know uh, Picasso and Brock and those kind of guys. It's like, hey, I was in that, Fortunately, I was in that scene. I had enough money to be lucky enough to be able to buy a little bit of everybody's kind of a thing. Some of them, the one I really fell in love with was Richard. Uh, I, you know, I had like five Keith Haring's or is it seven probably, you know, little things, whatever. I almost got the last thing that uh, Jean-Michel did. Anne and I were getting money out of an ATM on Broadway just south of Houston Street. It's in the evening. Uh, you know, yeah, like three or four in the afternoon. And Jean-Michel walks by and says, hey, uh, airplane man, and uh, hey, Ken, hey, uh, hey, John, how you doing? Uh, you know, and, and that, that was that. We get money out of a machine. We walk up to the corner, and he's stuck on the corner of House, Southwest corner of Houston and, uh, and Broadway. And I said, Jean-Michel, I know that you're rich and famous and have a waiting list and all that other stuff going on. I said, but you're the only guy of the 1980s that I don't have in my, you know, in, in, in don't have anything of. And I, and I said, and uh, I said, you know, I just want to come by and, you know, like buy something small from you. He said, Ken, you don't have to pay for anything. Just come up to my studio and pick something out. And I said, well, how about now? Your studio is right there about 150 yards away. He said, I'm going on vacation in two hours or three hours. He said, call me as soon as I come back. And the second day he was back, he was dead. So it was like I almost got the last thing that Basquiat did. Oh, my but God. What, the last what, what a story. Ken, Ken I'm also going to ask. really told me. I know, it's crazy. Ken, I'm going to ask a bit of a direct and maybe an intrusive, intrusive question, but I'd like to try and get all the stories. And I've asked the same question to a lot of Richard Hamilton's friends, as you said earlier, you know, artists can be quite strange. And part of part of that is, you know, their 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 lifestyle. And it was no secret, you know, a lot of Hamilton's associates, including Basquiat, Herring and all these other people were taking drugs. Did you ever take drugs with with Hamilton? One time. And oddly enough, <laughs> it was at uh, I remember it was at the Christie Street uh, studio. And uh, he said uh, he had crack with him. And it was like, well, man, it's the one drug that I've never tried, you know. I said, uh, he said, well, let's do it. So at any rate, uh, he takes out a pipe and, you know, starts tooting away. I did one hit of it, and it was the scariest drug I ever did. I mean, it, like, A, I'm older. I thought I was going to die right then and there. It was like, you know, a rocket ship that was really terrifying in a way. And he actually told me, even though, you know, you see these pictures of him of like, you know, being a, you know, a needle junkie, bad, bad scene. Uh, he said crack is what really killed, got him. Uh, I don't know, you know, hey, that's not my intimate part of his life, whatever. But yeah, no, all of the, actually not all of them. I don't think Keith was, uh, was doing drugs. Keith was really a gentle, sweet, you know, lovely guy, easy to get along with. Uh, he was doing an opening at uh, at Shafrazi and C Castelli galleries at the same time in New York at one point. And I said, uh, I walked up to him, you know, the place is filled with, you know, a couple of hundred people in Shafrazi's gallery over on uh, Mercer Street. And it was like, 
I have one of his posters there. And I said, uh, hey, uh, Keith, I said, you know, I always wanted a baby from you. Can you can you give me one here? And he said, well, if I give it to you, he said, everybody's going to want one. And he turns around like this and he does a, uh, he does a baby and he signs it herring at the bottom of the, of the poster, which I still have. I never threw anything out of that time period, etc., except Basquiat used to give me little little sketches, and somehow or other, I can't find them. They are gone, and they, you know, they're unsigned anyhow, so they're worthless in a way. But they were just little characters that he would do, kind of mm. a thing when you know he'd get up in the morning and leave leave the apartment and you know uh, leave something for me. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, you know, but yeah, drugs, uh, hey, you know, uh, it was a thing of the time, probably still is a thing of this time. I'm sure artists are, actually artists, I think, are much more uh, money-oriented today than they used to be. Uh, and maybe they don't do drugs because of, you know, that there's a negative, break or, you know, negative thing charged to it, as it were. Mm. And to work, I mean, it's big it's big money, it's big deals. If you get the Gagosian to pick you up as an artist, I think you're, you know, you're probably a millionaire, basically. Uh, you know, there used to be, quote, starving artists. Now, these big, you know, the, the machine of promotion and selling stuff uh, is, like, ultra, ultra important. Uh, Andy, uh, you know, has been, like, a tremendously interesting and important aspect of Richard Hamilton's life. And I find now, oddly enough, that Richard is still in my life very greatly because of my collection, because of, let's say, my connection to you and other people that I know that have his stuff that want to know about him. And I've even been writing down stories about the memories of, of Richard, etc. because I think one of the things that's really lost in time about a lot of the great artists that were there, uh, you don't, they, they have their work, but you don't get who they were and what they were like and what stories or whatever. And I feel that it's nice to like have a body of work of information. It's like a companion piece to your book, which I don't know and haven't, I saw a little bit of it once when I was there. Uh, it's artwork, etc. But this is like a companion piece in a way. And it's not a book. It's just, a couple of stories at this point, but I thought of trying to get other people that I know that knew Richard. When Richard went over to, with, with I think about 10 East Village artists to Japan in 1980, whatever, I don't remember what year, uh, he befriended a, a, another artist friend of mine who was quite good. And they hung out together in, uh, in Tokyo. And then when Tokyo was finished and the art show was finished, they went off to, uh, to Thailand together to hang out in uh, uh, PP Beach and uh, 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 some Koh Samoy. And, uh, you know, they all make, so they have these stories of like how Richard, you know, Richard used to, you know, he, <laughs> he, would, he would go down the street and he loved to be, I won't say love, as he was, you know, his back was like bending over, he would build bicycles all the time. So if if there was a thrown out uh, uh, carriage, he would take the wheels off it. And you might have a wheel in the front that's this big, and then the wheel in the back that's like that big. And they were sculptures, I realize now. And he would do them, and then they, they would either be thrown out or destroyed, or some would steal them or whatever. And I never really thought about it, but he was building, you know, his transportation, and they were sculptures all the time. And he was just, he was amazingly talented. Um, there's so much to look forward to, Ken. I mean, as far as the, the, the market itself, you had the Rizzoli book, <coughs> excuse me, coming out in uh, 2022. It's now on their website. It's also on Amazon's website. It's not ready to purchase, but they're preparing to launch. You also have got the uh, making of the... Uh, Shadow Man documentary, but into a Hollywood movie. Oren Jacoby has confirmed that. We know there is there's a hedge fund sitting now who is you know, moving into this market. Um, and then with us uh, as a brand, we're playing our part. So we're flying Nemo Labrizi over on the 29th of October uh, to do a talk and a Q&A at the Hamyard Hotel. We're looking like we're doing a presentation over Miami Art Bar, uh, Basel, uh, in December at maybe a very famous uh, hotel over there. We've got lots of things happening next year. We're going to disrupt the art market in a positive way 
and I'm definitely, definitely bringing more and more collectors, investors, guests onto the podcast to talk about the narrative and story. So I wanted to conclude this podcast by just saying thank you, Ken. You've been a great guest. You've been a great speaker. Can I, can I add throw one thing in before yeah, you sure. run away? When we were last in uh, in London and I came and visited your studio, uh, I, I reached out to Andy and I said, uh, you know, like, hey, even though I've loaned you things, you've never actually seen my whole collection. And Anne had put together, uh, you know, uh, the, the photos of all the, the, the work that I have of, of, of uh, Richard's stuff. So I said, hey, let's meet for lunch one day. He said, you pick a place. I said, no, I don't know, you know, a place. You pick a place, you know, something unpretentious. He said, how about the Connaught? So we go to the Connaught, and I show him, we, we sit down for, for lunch, and I show him the, uh, the, the, the collection, and he picks up the phone, and he calls Rizzoli, and he says, stop the press. He said, there are some masterworks that have to come into the book. Uh-huh. And so I ended up having to fly to New York, to get the things photographed and got them rushed done and sent them back over to Andy so that he could get them into the book. So knock wood, the world will actually see some of these things if they made the deadline. I believe they made the deadline by a day. Sorry for interrupting your departure. No problem. Uh, Everybody wants pieces that goes into that Rizzoli book because the example I've given my clients is it's almost like buying a piece of real estate and obtaining planning permission. The moment that planning permission is obtained for that real estate, the value of it goes up. And Rizzoli is a bit like your planning permission for your art. The moment they endorse and validate your art in that book, the values are definitely going to go up. And it's not just about values. It's about recognition, validation. But let's be honest, you know, if you've got something that has that kudos attached to it, my God, what a great investment and what a great collection. You've been a star. Your wife's a star. I think you're a great person. I think you're great people. Love to hang out hang out when I get over to New York at some point soon. And um, yeah, Ken, just watch this space. We're going to be doing so much more here. That's very exciting to hear that, you know, you're doing something, the Times is doing something, that the Miami Art Show is going to be promoting Richard and uh, my visibility. Uh, he deserves it. You know, he really does. And uh, his demise was very sad and uh, really painful to, 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 to be aware of. And he deserves... He deserves the recognition. He was he was he was fabulous. You know, he was, he was besides interesting and an interesting guy, etc. His artwork was is I won't say priceless because there's a price on everything, but he was the best. He really was the best, in my opinion, for that time period. Good man. Thank you for having me on, Stephen. No I problem. Appreciate it. It's been an absolute honor. Be happy, never content, and I'll speak to you very soon, Ken. All right. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for the call. Ciao. God bless. Bye.